The forum today is Brother Johnny Ramsey. Brother Ramsey needs no introduction, but we would like to make these observations quite hurriedly that, uh, as always, in an open forum type situation, there may be those questions asked or comments made that might uh, stir controversy. If that be the case, we don't want to dodge any issues, but we do want to meet those issues in a Christian manner. So we would ask you, as always you have, to be very kind, considerate, charitable in your comments. Now then, uh, without further ado, Brother Ramsey will answer these questions. We never come to occasions like this without, first of all, being grateful we live in a land of freedom where we can gather in assemblies like this and study God's word openly and freely and straightforwardly. We're also grateful that there are still people in the church of the Lord interested in truth and are striving to search the scriptures and maintain an attitude of courage and conviction, challenged by the truth to stand up for Jesus, to oppose error, to keep ever in mind the purity of the church, I've always believed, first of all, that it's a wonderful thing that we still have folk who care enough to want to know what the Bible says. And then I also am aware of the fact that I'm just a human being guiding and leading this discussion. I don't claim to have all the answers. In fact, I really believe that there are only three or four of us left that are dumb enough to accept the invitation to do this. <laughs> so <clears throat> there is no spirit of arrogance uh, uh, by those who stand here, but a lot of fear and trembling. I know what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 2 about fear and trembling. And really our purpose in such a gathering is to study and to seek and to learn and to grow and not to be angry and upset. And it never has bothered me when people say, well, I disagreed with your answer. If that means that both they and I will study the Bible more, then we have everything to gain, don't we? And really I believe people are a little bit crazy to quit listening when someone says something they think they don't agree with. That's the time we ought to start listening best. I've learned a lot from books that I disagreed with. They've made me study more. And we've all lived long enough to learn better than some positions we once held because the more we study the Bible, the more prepared and equipped we ought to be to be good soldiers of Christ. So there are a lot of good positive things even before we begin. And then one of the best things that happened to me this year is that I have it on Wednesday instead of Thursday and I can give Roy all the calls of the ones we didn't want to answer. <laughs> and I inherited three or four of those from the previous ones. Uh, don't ever accept Thursday. That's the bad thing. I've, that's one thing I've learned and I'm a little slow but even I've learned that. Now here are three or four questions that were left over from other discussions and we want to try to get them in order as much as we can. And I'm reading the question now. Don't blame me for the questions and the wording of them. It's just the answers that I'm in trouble on. It begins, as Brother Dub McClish pointed out in his lesson on Galatians 1, 6 through 10, false teachers in the New Testament were men who intentionally taught false doctrine for the purpose of drawing people away from Christ. We never see this name given to a man who ignorantly teaches false doctrine in the New Testament, such as Apollos. Why are we today so ready to apply the name false teacher to a brother who in all sincerity teaches what he believes to be the truth, but who is in error? It seems that applying this name to everyone who teaches false doctrine is an indictment on a man's character and motives that is completely foreign to the New Testament. <coughs> in other words, the only time, according to the question, that we could properly call someone a false teacher is if we knew for sure he taught false doctrine on purpose with the intention of doing harm to the body of Christ. As I read that, and I have in the last six months answered a similar question uh, concerning an article that appeared in a periodical that I was editor of, uh, it seems to me there's an awful lot of overemphasis on what we call someone who teaches false doctrine rather than what those who teach false doctrine do to the brotherhood. I, I'm really not overly concerned with what we call something if what we call it is true if what we say is right and we can document it. However, you can even call someone a false teacher guilty of false doctrine and not do it in a hateful way. Under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I don't believe anyone would call the Holy Spirit ugly and unkind and unfair, there were actual names called. 
In the first century, uh, when Paul wrote Timothy and Titus, he didn't say somebody somewhere did an evil deed, but I'm not going to tell you who it was. He said Demas, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Alexander, Alexander the coppersmith, and Romans 16, 17, his brother Klein used, still says mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you've received and avoid them. So whatever you may call them, it's what they're doing that uh, rends havoc upon the body of Christ. I believe we do not put a precious enough premium on truth and salvation and the redeemed souls of men, nor do we uh, esteem as highly as we should the terrible, deadly, hellish, eternal effect that error has upon people. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Solomon wrote, inspired of God, buy the truth and sell it not, Proverbs 23, 23. And I believe that context and emphasis means whatever it costs you to purchase the truth, pay the price, and even if it causes you your life, it's a bargain. And Paul said, am I therefore your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4, 16. I talked with Brother McClish just before we started because I didn't get to hear his speech the other day, his lesson, and asked him uh, if this fairly represented what he was trying to get across. And, of course, no one would expose error any more straightforwardly than Dub would and has, or stand for truth any more forcefully than he always does. And his point was that in the specific context, he was mentioning that those false teachers there were uh, willfully teaching another doctrine, another gospel. Uh, there are false teachers who teach false doctrine on purpose, and they need to be exposed. There are some false teachers since I can't read hearts and minds, who may have a better spirit and attitude, but if they teach false doctrine, what's wrong with calling them false teachers? You know, if there were several people counterfeiting money in Tarrant County, I'll tell you the most dangerous counterfeit money of all would be that nearest to the truth, and that which was handed out by a pleasant, smiling politician. He'd be more deadly than the fellow who looked like a bum and had uh, paper of a different color, and the pictures upside down, and the windows shut instead of halfway up, and and uh, so forth. So if we're not careful, we're going to accommodate false teachers instead of realize what they're doing. And if a man is teaching false doctrine, he's a false teacher. Now, we do, though, in exposing error, even when we have to call names, we must do it in a documented way. We must do it with kindness and love. And let me express this point. Love for truth. Love for lost souls. Love for the church of the Lord. There's a lot of love that I don't hear discussed much anymore. Another thing, I've pointed out false teachers before and talked to them personally who now are not only not teaching false doctrine, they're preaching the gospel. And had we not pointed out their error straightforwardly, they'd still be teaching it probably. So I know some people who can speak of false teaching in a general way and be uglier than people who say he is a false teacher and call him by name because there is an ability of kindness and straightforwardness and documented fact to back it up. The Bible very clearly says many false teachers have already gone out in the world. 1 John 4 verse 1. 2 Peter 2 1 says there were false prophets among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them bring upon themselves swift destruction. The Bible tells us to expose error. From prison, Paul said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1.17. Years ago, I asked a man why, when he exposed error, he always called the names of those teaching it. I said, why don't you just deal with the error? He, he said, if I could ever find error walking down the street by itself and not attached to someone proclaiming it, I'd do that. And that may be a unique and quaint way of putting it, but sometimes we've got to call names in order to make it known. As Brother Keeble said, when the Lord went out to the cemetery to raise Lazarus, he called names. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And if he hadn't called names, the whole graveyard would have stood up. <laughs> so there may be a good point to that, too. In 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, Paul said, Hymenaeus and Philetus have made shipwreck of the faith. I have delivered them over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme, that their soul may be saved in the day of judgment. Perhaps if he hadn't have done that, they would never have known that they subverted or capsized truth and upset the good ship of faith. A preacher, a friend of mine, an older preacher, when I was first beginning to preach, in summer meetings, whether it was in North Carolina or 
where he would send me a postcard encouraging me to be a gospel preacher and telling of the results of the meeting. And one time he wrote and said we had a wonderful meeting in Winston-Salem. We had five baptized and six capsized. I still, still don't know for sure what he meant, but I believe he was basing it upon this passage. They subverted the truth. They turned the good ship of faith upside down, and he called them by name. And so what they're doing is more important than what they're called. And if they're teaching error, it isn't wrong to point out that they are because that makes the truth shine more brilliantly. Again, though, we must do it in love. Love for them, love for truth, love for souls that they are leading astray, love for the purity of the church. The psalmist said, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalm 119, verse 104. Amos 5, 15 says, hate the evil and love the good. And Romans 12, 9, the counterpart in the New Testament, abhor that which is evil, plead with that which is good. Ephesians 5, 11 commands us to expose error. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them. We need to be careful to do that. Jesus said in Mark 7 and Matthew 15 parallel accounts concerning religious leaders of the day, full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions. The apostles came to Jesus and said, you've offended the people. Did Jesus say, we'll rush back and apologize to them? I'm sorry. He said, no, they're blind leaders of the blind. They'll both fall into the ditch, and every plant my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. And I imagine that offended them some more. But Jesus could not apologize for the truth that he had spoken. Would you accuse him of not speaking it in love, since he loved the souls of all men and died for them? In 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, we have one of the bluntest passages in all the Bible concerning how an inspired ambassador spoke of those who had perverted the truth. You might want to turn to that. 1 Thessalonians 2. I don't hear this read very often or even referred to. It has to do with <coughs> those who rejected Christ and the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, beginning with verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, nor contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Now there's an inspired ambassador. <laughs> In Romans 10, 1 to 3, Paul said, They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Of whom was he speaking? The religious elite of his day. In Mark 12, 24, our blessed Lord said to the Sadducees, You do greatly err, not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God. And whatever he may have called them beyond that, he could not have insulted them more within the framework of religious upper echelon thinking. He was speaking to the upper crust. And he said, You're gravely mistaken. You don't know the scriptures, neither the power of God. And yet they need to hear that. And on the positive side of a negative matter, and I worry about people who say they don't want any negative preaching. Can we be positive about negative things? The Bible is. In Revelation 2.2, 2, the Lord commended the church at Ephesus for trying those who claim to be apostles and finding them false. Today we'd have brethren who would only commend those who didn't say anything about false teaching. He commended them for finding false teachers and exposing them. And elders of the church are commanded to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. Titus 1, verses 9 and 10. That's a commandment. Well, we've got to be specific sometimes. And if we call someone who teaches error a false teacher, wherein have we erred? Are they false teachers? When you just identify people for what they are, that's just... For instance, I've never known what's wrong with saying the Baptists teach the following thing and quote from their sources. If Why is that rude? To just quote what they themselves say they believe from their own works. We need to identify what we're talking about. And we do have another <laughs> question that I want to throw in here because it belongs to this same point that was handed to me a little while ago. It has to, here it is. In order that the church might grow in knowledge and defense of the truth, why do we not identify by name those who continually abuse the truth in preaching false doctrines? That is, Dan Billingsley, Bill Benoski, Rubel Shelley, and so forth, so that members will be warned 
and uh, we can all pray for uh, these uh, that they might repent. Uh, what would be wrong with just identifying the false teachers we're talking about? I don't know of anything that would be wrong with it. Again, in love, love for them, love for truth, love for the church, love for purity. Now, we'll open up the floor since we combine those two for comments. Now, we do have other questions, and we're not going to be able to have an extensive discussion of each one of these, but let's honor a couple of questions or comments. Uh, if you'll just raise your hand, they'll bring the microphone to you. Anyone? You mean we thoroughly, completely satisfied everybody? I believe we need to stand and sing. <laughs> I will right, we'll go to another one, and that might, uh, does one have biblical authority to baptize a person who is divorced for an unbiblical reason and has remarried? If not, should one question one who wishes to be baptized concerning his or her marital status? If so, where is our example for doing this? Well, in Acts 8, uh, Philip said to the Ethiopian, if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. Here's water, what does him be to be baptized? Was Philip being rude when he said, if you believe with all your heart, we may. Would you baptize an infidel? What if uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare came to you and said, won't you baptize me? Would it be rude or crude or anti-biblical in emphasis to say, are you still an atheist? Are you an infidel? I cannot baptize you unless you believe, because he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. John the Immerser was in the baptizing business. He's called John the Baptizer. Some people mockingly said, baptize us. He said, not till you bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And he was in the baptizing business. Yes, he refused to baptize people until they repented because the Bible says repent and be baptized. Acts 2.38. <laughs> Incidentally, when parents and grandparents bring their children or grandchildren to me, as they often do to other gospel preachers, and say our 10 or 12 year old child or grandchild thinks they want to be baptized, would you question them and see if they're ready or not? I have never, ever yet asked them about baptism. I've asked them about repentance. And not one of them has ever been able to give a Bible definition of repentance. So they're not ready to be baptized. Because you've got to know what repentance is before we can be scripturally baptized. Yes, I've refused to baptize impenitent people. And in Matthew 21, 28 to 30, we learn what repentance is. Jesus said a certain man had two sons. He said, go into my field and work. One said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. What is repentance? A change of mind. His previous mind said, I will not. But he repented and went. He changed his mind. Here's a person living in adultery. They say, baptize me because baptism washes away all sin and then I can be free and cleansed and Friend, do you intend to continue living in this adulterous relationship? I said baptize me so I can have all my sins washed away. Baptism's powerful, but it won't wash away adultery. Unless they have a change of mind in regard to that, they're not scriptural subjects for baptism. And I mock God when in hypocrisy we go down in that baptistry together. In Acts chapter 19, the question was asked of 12 men who had been baptized. Unto what then were you baptized? I believe we have a right to ask some questions prior to baptism. But I'll tell you what our problem is, brethren, and I'm talking about all of us. And we've created the monster because of our improper and unbalanced preaching. We have preached so much on baptism, we've converted people to baptism instead of Christ who commanded it. We've got a lot of people in the church that were ducked in water that never repented. And that's why we've got so much worldliness in the church. They brought it in with them because we ducked them in water. We need to spend another decade or two or three emphasizing repentance so people will be ready for baptism. But this idea of I can be living with my 13th wife and just be ducked in water and come right on in and have all my sins washed away, the Bible teaches no such thing. Yes, we have a right to ask a lot of different questions in order to keep the church pure and to emphasize what repentance is all about. Except you repent, you'll perish, Luke 13, 3. All men everywhere must repent, Acts 17, 30. Now the other argument, people say, but you cannot live in adultery. You commit adultery, you don't live in it. That's not what the Bible says. In Colossians 3, 1 to 7, 
He says, as he mentions all these sinful practices, the works of the flesh, he said, which sometimes you lived in them. And the only way to repent of adultery is to get out of an adulterous relationship. John the Immerser lost his head because he said it's not lawful for you to have her. And there are a lot of brethren today who would like to chop off some preacher's head too. But I believe John the Immerser will be in heaven, don't you? And I want to be in eternity where he is for the truth he stood for also. I wish we wouldn't be so everlastingly overwhelmed with numerical growth in the first place. After all, the Lord adds men to the church anyhow. I can't shove them in. You can't take the kingdom by violence. I can't force people into the kingdom. When they gladly receive the word and obey the Lord, he will add them to the church. Acts 3.19 says, Repent and turn again. Repentance precedes turning again, and it's the change of mind that prompts you to turn again. They're not the same thing. Repent and do something else. We've got to change our mind before we can turn in the direction of heaven, and you can't change your mind about adultery if you keep living in it. And if we weren't so concerned with numerical growth, I, one brother who espoused the now very popular doctrine <coughs> on this matter of adultery and so forth, I heard him speak to about 30 or 40 of us, and uh, he said, you brethren who teach these things, just paint yourself in a corner on evangelism. He said, about every third house, you knock on their door to try to convert them, you'll find adultery there. And said, you're just painting yourself into a corner with this obsolete view on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Well, do I paint myself in a corner when I teach God's plan of salvation? There's not 2% of the people in the whole world that believe it. But I've still got to teach the truth if no one believes it. And then when we get to instrumental music and worship, there's not one half of 1% of the 4.7 billion people in the world that believe what we believe the Bible teaches on that. Are we going to quit teaching on it? I guess some brethren are. We've got to preach the truth and let the Lord take care of the increase and decrease. And he not only adds men to the church and gives the increase, Revelation 3 says he blots names out that no longer belong there. We ought to be interested in purity and truth and not in numerical growth in our own aggrandizement. But I believe we've got the cart before the horse, and one of our big problems is, rather than build these huge cathedrals that cost millions and millions of dollars, and they get anxious to get some people in the pews to pay for the building debt. And so we lower our standards on what it takes to be a member of the church. And not 10% of brethren anywhere practice church discipline, so we fill these cathedrals with unconverted, impenitent, immoral, worldly people, and then wonder what's happened to the church. We need to back up and meet out in the field or in a barn somewhere with a handful of faithful brethren if that's what it takes to get New Testament Christianity in full throttle. Was that what you had in mind on that question? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sorry I couldn't get into that. That was just kind of a <laughs> meaningless question to me. But now we'll open up for a discussion, uh, maybe three or four this time. Anyone want to make a comment? Raise your hand and they'll pass the microphone to you. It did bite a couple of people yesterday there, so you might, they're in the hospital now, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Be strong and brave. You mean everybody's still fully satisfied? That is wonderful. Next question. Next question. Okay, we got some good ones. We'll stop here in a minute. Does God's word speak directly to me and every other person who has lived or will live? Also, is it my only authorize rule of faith and practice, or are there other authorities? I believe there is a little point of emphasis here that sometimes those of us who mean well don't make clear. Christ has all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. And God now speaks to us through his Son, Hebrews 1, 1. But somewhere his authorized commands and standard of authority will be expressed. And where, where is that? In the New Testament, he mediates, Hebrews 8, 6, and 7. And it's the everlasting testament made such by the blood of the Lamb, Hebrews 13, 20. And since we're complete in Christ, Colossians 2, 10, and the scriptures furnish us completely unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17, yea, verily, the sole standard of authority expressed under the banner of Christ who is king and ruler of my soul is the Bible and particularly the New Testament sealed in his blood. There is no other standard of authority. Now, we have the perfect life of Christ 
Hebrews 4.15, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2.22. And that is revealed in the word. So Christ and his word form the standard of authority, the standard of authority that men must follow. And those who speak of some still small voice that speaks to them, or an angel who sat on the foot of the bed who preached uh, sweet peace to their soul, or a spasm they had out in the field when they were working uh, hard that overwhelmed them, better felt than told, and uh, so forth, or misguided because the final, full, absolute authority of Christ and his word. Acts 4.12 says there's salvation in none other. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. But I believe the pivotal verse in this and the clearest verse is John 16.13. The more I study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the more I'm convinced that John 16 is one of the pivotal chapters in all the Bible. The Lord said to the apostles, the Holy Spirit will come and guide you, the apostles, in all truth. I know from that that when the last apostle died, all the truth had been revealed. I think that has to be one of the great verses in all the Bible understood in context. The Holy Spirit guide the apostles into all truth, and since God is no respecter of persons, Romans 2.11, that which the Holy Spirit revealed the apostles in the first century is that standard of truth that each one of us is amenable to, answerable toward. And so in 2 Peter 1 3, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been revealed. Twice in Lubbock, I was invited through a series of, I believe, providential circumstances to meet the president of the Mormon Church in Texas in their church building in Lubbock. The first time, he gave me 35 minutes to just stand up and teach what churches of Christ believe, what we stand for. They were doing that to record it so that their boys going from door to door there would know exactly what they were facing so they could answer it. In the 35 minutes, I set forth the completeness, infallibility, uh, nature of the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. And then I asked the question, and I demanded he answer it when he came to the stand. Name one single thing the Book of Mormon provides and all of your other literature that pertains to life and godliness that hasn't already been found in the Bible. Name one thing. He spoke one hour and 20 minutes and never touched top side or bottom of it. And if you think I'm just saying that, his own people were so aggravated about it, they demanded a further and longer discussion about three months later because they wanted to find out if they couldn't answer that. And he still hadn't given one single thing, and they never will, that pertains to life and godliness that's found anywhere else except in the book. So yes, the Bible speaks to us individually and directly, and we're answerable to it. And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, 68. And John 12, 48, Jesus said, The words I've spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. In Romans 2, 16, Paul said, Amen. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So it is given to us. We're answerable to it. And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, 15. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Any comment on this? Yes. Brother Ramsey, I'd like to make a comment. First of all, on the question that was presented about uh, the false teacher, whether he's known to be a false teacher or not, as to whether or not we can call him that, if he's practicing it on purpose or out of ignorance. It seems to me in 1 John chapter 4, where John said every uh, individual that does not confess Jesus is the Christ uh, is the Antichrist. Uh, that's in ignorance or knowingly. Uh, the second thing, I would like to hear your comments on uh, this subject of authority, uh, particularly in the realm of amenability, uh, as to comments that are being made uh, today, both sides, <laughs> Uh, with regard to, well, the terminology that's being used is the covenant law of Christ for the church versus the covenant law of Christ for the alien sinner. Uh, for example, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, attending, giving, so forth, mm -hmm. as to where the alien sinner stands in regard to those commands. Would you comment on that, please? First of all, if all men everywhere must repent, Acts 1730, that proves that all men everywhere are amenable to Christ. And in John 17, verses 2 and 3, we learn that the whole world is subject unto Christ. Now, whether men acknowledge it or not is their problem. From heaven's vantage point, Jesus tasted of death for every man, Hebrews 2.9.
He is the one who died for all. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And God wants men, all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. Those passages overwhelm any of the quibbling arguments or syllogisms or statements made for debate that anyone could draw up. I believe those passages alone take care of that matter. Now, whether a person who is not a member of the church should partake of the Lord's Supper is another matter. Anytime I've ever brought a friend of mine that I was teaching the gospel to who hadn't obeyed the truth and they asked what would be happening in the assembly, I would tell them that the Lord placed the Lord's Supper in his kingdom for his people. Luke chapter 22. I let them know that. I think that's even fair to them to equip them with that knowledge. But uh, to say that uh, those who have not yet obeyed Christ are not under his authority minimizes the power of all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 18. It just reflects upon people who will not surrender their will to the Lord's will, even though they're answerable to that will. In John 7, 17, Jesus said, If a man will to do my will, he shall know if the teaching be of God. Now, whether he wills to do his will or not, he is still answerable to the word of God. His attitude, though, blocks him off from keeping it and makes him a lost individual. <laughs> All right, any other comment on what we... Yes. Brother Ramsey, um... It seems like Brother Dan Billingsley of Denton, Texas has taken one position, maybe I've misunderstood him, and then he's made some pretty ugly accusations against sound brethren. I would like for you to, maybe this extent of your knowledge, explain what it is he does teach, and uh, just any comments you'd like to on that, just to help us understand. I would say one thing that I've personally been involved in, so I can document this, there were others present, but. The day that uh, President Reagan was shot, I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, but the reason I remember this is on the way back from the discussion that I had with Brother Dan, uh, we, Gary Workman and I were in an automobile and we heard on the radio about President Reagan being shot. So on that day in Denton, Texas, before about 55 or 60 elders and preachers, I met Dan in a discussion and I insisted it not be called a debate. I want it to be brotherly and uh, low-key discussion. And on that occasion, we were discussing what about the Gentiles in the Old Testament. That's where it first began. And these other things have progressed as we predicted that day that they would. I had previously spent four hours talking with Dan before in Louisville, Roger Johnson and I one day, letting him state everything he believed, and we didn't say a word for an hour and a half, and that's some kind of a record for me. And uh, then we asked him what he was trying to prove and what was the purpose of it. But in the discussion in Denton, it was on what about the Gentiles. He took the point that once God gave the law of the Jews at Sinai, that he just shut the Gentiles off. They were as though they did not exist. They were not uh, amenable to him, and they were as though they were zero. Now, that has a lot of serious ramifications. Number one, it makes God a fiend to require of people something they know nothing of and aren't answerable for. Jonah preaching to Nineveh. There's a case of Gentiles hearing the word of God. And you know the strange thing, they understood it immediately, reacted to it, repented of their sins, and God forgave them. But I'll tell you the unanswerable argument for that, and this is the background of it. Out of all this, this other has evolved. The first two chapters of Amos are unanswerable. God has his prophet rebuking at least five heathen, pagan, Gentile nations and saying for three transgressions and for four, I have thus and thus and thus against you. Why would he waste his prophet's time and those Gentiles' time rebuking them for something they weren't answerable for? And I predicted that day that if he pursued this course, he's going to get in trouble on marriage, divorce, and remarriage issues and a lot of other things. And the main thing wrong with the whole heresy, and I want you to listen to this carefully, is the misuse, and I've heard other brethren misuse this too, that's why we need to be careful about every context and think about it. His misuse of Ephesians chapter 2. He said the Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2. That's his strong suit. I said, Dan, do you not know the passage in the Old Testament that's quoted from? That's a quotation of 2 Chronicles 15 verse 2, wherein God is speaking to Israel, to Judah, and he says to them, you are without hope and without God in the world. And everybody 
in all ages who have not surrendered to the will of God or without hope and without God in the world. Jew, Gentile, or those before the law and those after. We better be careful the way we use passages because they may get us in trouble if we're not consistent. <coughs> now that's <laughs> enough on that. I need to get to a couple of more and then we will spend the rest of the time with you uh, speaking. But this is very, very important because of something that was said earlier today <coughs> concerning free from law. Are we not under law today? Is it improper to speak of Christians being under law? Does the grace of God nullify any law at all? Are we under law or are we not? First of all, Isaiah chapter 2 proves we are under law because in that notable prophecy, seven centuries before Pentecost, it was predicted that from the top of the mountain, the Lord's house would be established and the law of the Lord would go forth. If we're not under law today, that passage has not yet been fulfilled. 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of God's law. If we're not under law at all today, you can't sin because sin is transgression of law. But Paul says, I am under law to Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 to 23. He said, so fulfill the law of Christ. Written to Christians, Galatians 6, 1 and 2. James 1.25 calls it the perfect law of liberty. It is a law. What's wrong with being under God's law? Someone says, but Romans says we're under grace. Paul said, I preach the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 verse 24. Yeah, we're under law. The perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ, the law of faith, Romans 3, 24 to 27. I'm under law to Christ, and I'd rather be legal than illegal. But what's wrong with obeying the commands of the Lord? That doesn't make you legalistic. That makes you a loving servant who said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Yes, we're under law today. Actually, the book of Romans teaches, and I want you to listen carefully, a system of obedient faith, a system of faith that must be obeyed. That's Romans 1, 5, first chapter, Romans 16, 26, last chapter. Yes, we are under a system of faith that must be obeyed. Now let me share with you these correlating passages. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 6, 7. Elimus the sorcerer withstood the faith. Acts 13, 8. Felix and Drusilla came down into prison to hear Paul concerning the faith. Acts 24, 24. Contend earnestly for the faith. Jude verse 3. The Spirit speaketh expressing the latter time some should depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 4 1. I now preach that faith which I once destroyed. Galatians 1 23. And the book of Romans speaks of a system of faith, the gospel system, which must be obeyed as contrasted with the law of Moses. Actually, in Romans 4, when he cites Abraham, he's answering one of their foolish arguments. It's the same argument they made to Christ in John 8. We have Abraham is our father. Jesus in John 8 said, Abraham is not your father. The devil is your father. He was a liar from the beginning. And Abraham always obeyed me. And before Abraham was, I am. He always obeyed me. You never do. He was simply stating that your example of Abraham ruins your argument, not mine. Abraham was pleasing to God through a system of obedient faith before the law of Moses was ever given. And Christianity is a system of obedient faith after the law has been nailed to the cross. So if you want to be saved like Father Abraham, you'll be obedient to the system of faith God has for you. Two passages to prove that. Three. Genesis 22, 18. Abraham, God said, Because you have obeyed my voice, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 26, 5. Abraham, you're my friend. Because you have kept my statutes and charges, my commandments and laws. James 2, 23. He was the friend of God because he worked righteousness. Not self-righteousness, not personal righteousness. He cooperated with the righteousness of God. And all of God's commandments are righteousness. You don't have to apologize for obeying the commandments of God. That's not legalism, that's love in action. And Jesus said so. In 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. And they never have been grievous to people who love the Lord. Now we'll pause for a minute and a half. Anybody else? 
That would have been a good question. Now, don't tell me I didn't give you the opportunity to say something. Sit down there. All right. <laughs> Acts 2.38. You if you thought I was ignorant before, you're going to know it now. I'm dumb enough to read this question and answer it. In front of all you heretics. <laughs> In Acts 2.38, when it speaks of the gift of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> what is he speaking of? Does it have anything to do with 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20? Also, uh, how does he dwell if he dwells in us? I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38 is the Holy Spirit himself. If I tell my son, you mow this yard and I'll give you the gift of this watch, what is the gift? It's the watch. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a gift. Someone says it doesn't say that. It does in Acts 5.32. We're his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, 1 John 3, 24, Romans 8, 11, all teach. The Holy Spirit is given unto us. He dwells in us. How does he dwell in us? You'll never hear me say, only through the word. That's not found in the Bible. You'll not even hear me say it is the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That, that phrase isn't there either. I'm not denying that point. I'm just saying I don't use that phraseology because the Bible doesn't. The Bible says he dwells in me. I believe the Bible teaches that he helps me when I pray. Romans 8, 26 and 27. I've never learned why some brethren have a wall-eyed fit on that. If the Bible says the Holy Spirit helps me when I pray, I'm thankful with all the help I can get. But, it's not something he does for us or to us on earth, but for us in heaven. I do not know how a brown cow eats green grass and gives white milk and yellow butter, but I really appreciate the productivity of that arrangement. <laughs> I don't know how an apple grows on a tree, but I enjoy apple pie with a slice of cheese on it. We walk by faith and not by sight. And if the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian and the Holy Spirit is given to us when we obey him, What's wrong with that? What's wrong with believing that? The Bible says he helps us when we pray. I'll accept every blessing and every help I can get. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we have of God. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are his. That's just a challenge for us to do better than we've ever done before. How does the Holy Spirit given unto us bless our life? I believe the best answer is Galatians 5, 22 to 24. He helps us produce the fruit of the Spirit. Against such there is no law. I believe sometimes if we're not careful, we're going to become so afraid of teaching truth that someone might misuse that we'll quit teaching the truth that God intended for us to teach. I've had brethren say, why, if you teach Romans 8, 26, and 27 like that, look what that will do. You mean preaching the truth can be a damaging thing? How can teaching the truth ever do any harm? It's our failure to teach the whole counsel of God that does harm. Nobody in this world believes in the inspiration and integrity of the Bible more than I do or will try to present more of it at a time than I do. But that does not mean that we cannot teach everything the Bible says. I believe what I've just said about the Holy Spirit because that's what the Bible teaches. And not one ounce of that makes me believe in hocus pocus, Pentecostalism. It makes me believe in what the Bible says. Why should I apologize for what the Bible says? And when people start saying, but if you teach what the Bible says there, look at the consequences. I don't know of any bad consequences of teaching the truth. I know of several when we withhold some of it. I'm saving the easy ones for Roy tomorrow. <laughs> you have listened well and haven't confused us very much with idle chatter. <laughs> and those of you who went to sleep didn't snore. It's been a wonderful day. <laughs> and Eddie didn't come up here too quick.